Well, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Sunday morning here at Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. We uh, very, very happy to be here with you. For those of you who are joining us uh, via the internet, uh, we want to say good morning to you as well. Um, it's always an honor to be here and be part of this this worship service. Jan and I uh, take this very seriously, and uh, we thank you guys for for coming and, and being part of it each week. It, it, it really is uh, amazing what uh, what God's doing, and uh, some of what we're going to talk about today. This is uh, have a message that's sort of the uh, state of the of the worship service kind of deal, <laughs> the state of the union speech of. Uh, what God's doing, or what what I see God uh, doing uh, through the through this little small worship service, and uh, so we're go we're going to be. Uh, if you want to take your Bibles, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in the Book of Esther. That's in the Old Testament, and uh, we're going to be teaching out of the Book of Esther today. Before we do that, we got a couple of hymns, and uh, we're going to sing. Uh, want to remind uh, some of the folks uh, again over the internet. We we have a just a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, we have an email address now that uh, is just lowercase Jesus, the letter N, genes, all written together, Jesus and genes at gmail.com. And uh, so we'd like to invite you to drop us a line and, and let us know how we're doing and uh, give us any kind of input that you'd like. Uh, as well, we, we started a YouTube channel and now you can go to uh, to YouTube, and you actually have to look up uh, capital J Jesus uh, space apostrophe in space genes, because there's a lot of Jesus and genes, or genes and Jesus and Jesus and blue genes. And I never even knew when we were doing all this stuff that you know there were so many out there. You know, I didn't didn't do any research in that area. <laughs> so, uh, if you, so if you go in Jesus space apostrophe in space genes, you can hook up to our YouTube channel and you can actually subscribe to it. And once they get your email, uh, they'll, they'll send you an alert uh, when a, a new service is uploaded to the channel. Uh, and what we do is when we finish here on Sunday morning is that we, uh, we upload that right away because we have fiber optic here. <laughs> we have Fred Flintstone at our house. And so we have to go out there and, you know, get the feet going and crank up the turbine. And, you know, it takes like five hours to upload. You know. So uh, we do it here with fiber optic. It goes up in about 15 minutes. And uh, so it's there for you to watch and, and, and enjoy. And uh, again, give us any kind of input. Uh, you can input on the YouTube channel as well. So, with that little bit of business taken care of, uh, let's worship the Lord. There's a couple of great hymns today. Uh, as, a, as God was just dealing with me this week, I start I start thinking about, okay, Lord, what, what are, how are we going to praise you this, this morning uh, musically? And uh, these are uh, a couple of my favorites. So...
great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou thank you for your faithfulness. We come to you this morning, not in our own strength, but in the power of Jesus' name. We thank you, God, that you love us so much, that your grace is so abundant, that it just flows freely to those of us who claim your Son as Savior. We ask you this morning, Father, as we talk about what you're doing, that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would give us hearts that would be yielded to your grace and your love and your power in each one of us. Thank you so much for loving us, Father. Thank you for every single day that you give us. We ask your blessings here today in our service, Father, in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, 
Today, as I said, we're going to be in the uh, book of Esther. And uh, the title of this message is, is called, For Such a Time as This. There was an author, his name's Jim Collins. And he wrote a book, uh, actually several years ago now. He wrote a book that was called, uh, it's called From Good to Great. And it's actually a business uh, book. It's not a, not a Christian book at all. It was a business book about how companies go from being just a, a good, ordinary type of company to becoming a great company. And in one excerpt from uh, his book, he talks about, I, when I was on staff at the church uh, in uh, South Carolina, we, we were required to, to read this book uh, because we were all about paradigm change. You know, how do we change the normal paradigm of, of doing church? What are we going to do different? How are we going to be different to impact the world around us? And so this was required reading for our staff. And one excerpt uh, from, the, from his book, he talks about how change doesn't happen. And, uh, and he says it this way. He says, picture an egg. Day after day, it sits there. No one pays attention to it. No one notices it. Certainly no one takes a picture of it or puts it on the cover of a celebrity-focused business magazine. Then one day, the shell cracks and out jumps a chicken. All of a sudden, the major magazines and newspapers jump on the story. Stunning turnaround at Egg. And the chick who led the breakthrough at Egg. And so from the outside looking in, the story always reads like an overnight sensation. As if the egg had suddenly and radically altered itself into a chicken. Now picture the egg from the chicken's point of view. While the outside world was ignoring this seemingly dormant egg, the chicken within was evolving and growing and developing and changing. From the chicken's point of view, the moment of breakthrough of cracking the egg was simply one more step in a long chain of steps that had led to that moment. Granted, it was a big step, but it was hardly the radical transformation that it looked like from the outside. As I reflected on this analogy, I began to see how it applies to what we're doing here at Jesus and Jeans. Taking the chicken's point of view, we've been inside an egg. We've been growing. We've been evolving. We've been maturing. We've been teaching. We've been reaching out to the public. Now, via the internet, we are literally transmitting to the world this worship service. And so what we're doing, we're doing all the things that we do consistently each week. And in the process, one of the things that, that God has really pointed out to me is that we're beginning to see lives touched. We're, we're beginning to see hearts changed. And again, not that muscle that beats in your chest. It's, it's the inner person, that inner being of who we are. And most importantly, God's wonderful grace is being applied and accepted into our lives. And those are life-changing, life-altering 
things, for lack of a better word, that, that God is doing in this worship service each week. And who gets the glory for all of that being accomplished? Well, it's certainly not me. God does. God gets all of the glory. He has placed us, all of us, together. Right here. Right now. For such a time as this. And when, you, when I look back over the last year and a half of what God has been doing, it's, it, it, it really is overwhelming. And you can take a, a broken down old 64 year old, I tell you, I was 64. <laughs> broken down 64 year old, you know, minister who now just enjoys playing music and singing and just kind of out there doing, you know, my own thing and never wanted to go back into ministry at all. I was done with it. And all of this began with one question that Sandra and Jim asked. Thank you so much. <laughs> what if? What if? What would it look like? How would it start? What would it do? And that question always, uh, you know, I have an entrepreneurial spirit about me, that question always forces me to think in ways. I have a very analytical mind, so I'm, I'm thinking about things all the time. I told you all before, it's one thing I can't do is shut down my brain. I wish I could. But so I'm always thinking. And so if somebody says, well, what if? That's a great question. Let's look at it. And, and so almost a little over a year and a half now, we, we've been doing this. And, and the incredible thing is that you guys keep showing up. <laughs> you keep showing up. And each week we see new people, you know, that are either coming here physically or, you know, they're coming by internet or, or whatever. And it, it totally amazes me. So, again, this morning we're going to look at the, the book of Esther. And I want you to turn to the fourth chapter in the book of Esther. And we're going to be looking at, at verses 12 through 14. And I want you just to keep your finger in that passage. And we're going to come back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to give you uh, an overview of the story that brings us up to the point that we want to look at in chapter 4. This story in the book of Esther is a very, very powerful story. First, it's a story that has it all. It has good guys, it has bad guys, it has kings and queens, it has treachery and deception and heroism. It has all of these things. It's a wonderful, wonderful story of how God used women in the Bible to do incredible, incredible things. Just one of the stories. King Xerxes is the ruler of the Persian Empire. And so King Xerxes throws a big party. He throws this party to experience with the express purpose of showing off the extent of his riches and his wealth. Now this was just no ordinary party. This party lasted for 180 days. So King Xerxes is getting down. He's partying for 180 days. At the end of this time, King Xerxes sends for his wife, Queen Vashti. He wants to show off her beauty for all to see. And guess what? She refuses to come. 
she's having her own little soiree. And she says, no, I'm not going. And so <clears throat> King Xerxes has her banished from the kingdom based on the input of all the nobles and the people within his court that give him advice. And they said, you know, King, you, you got to set a precedence here. You know, you, a, a woman not coming when you're calling her, your wife not showing up when you call her, if, if she's not going to come, what's that going to say to the rest of the women in the kingdom? Can you imagine a, a, a wife not showing up when her husband says, come? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. That chance. Come a long way, baby. <laughs> and so King kicks her out. Says, you're out of here. Stripped her of her title. You're no longer queen. I never even want to see you in my presence ever again. Talk to the hand. Because <laughs> the king ain't listening. And so in that day and age, you didn't even approach the king unless you were called. And once you were called, you didn't dare refuse to be in his presence. So after the king kicks Queen Vashti out of the house, out of the kingdom, He's kind of sitting around by himself. How's that working for you? <laughs> and so he decides a king must have his queen. And so all the best, the most beautiful of all the women in the land were, giving, were given beauty treatments for a year. <laughs> And they were brought before the king. Six months of oil and myrrh and six months of perfume and cosmetics. Now ladies, how would you like to spend a year being pampered <clears throat> like that? <laughs> Left out the wine. <laughs> yeah, Left out the wine. Right? If, <laughs> if you remember the show American Idol, that's the kind of contest that this was. You start with hundreds, they show the, the very best that they have, and they're eliminated one by one until only one remains. The prize was much better than just a record deal. It was the kingdom that she won. And one of these girls was Esther. Esther was a Jew who was under the care of her cousin, Mordecai. Her parents, her family had died. We don't know how. And so following Mordecai's instructions, she was keeping her identity as a Jew concealed. And essentially, they were slaves in the kingdom. Now, here is this Jewish slave who is placed in a position to become the most powerful woman in the kingdom. And just a, a quick note to kind of catch you up on some, some of the history, the Old Testament history, because we don't, I don't teach a lot in the Old Testament. The Jews were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And the best and the brightest Jews were taken to be retrained or reprogrammed in Babylon. If you remember the story of Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Babylon, in, in, in this setting, these guys were, were part of those exiles who were captive, held captive there in Babylon. King Cyrus, the, the Babylon was defeated by King Cyrus the Persian. And the kingdom was passed on to his son, Darius. <clears throat> this is the king that threw Daniel into the lion's den. Xerxes, Darius passed the kingdom on to Xerxes. And so now Xerxes and the Jews 
are kind of in this relationship together. The Jews, many of them had gone back to Jerusalem, but many of them were still under the reign and control of Persia. And so that's how Esther came to be in this position. And the Bible says that Esther pleased the king and was made the queen of Medo-Persia. And God had placed one of his children in a position to save the Jewish people from what came next. Now, the rest of this story is, includes a man named a bad guy. He was a, he was a bad guy. His name was Haman. And Haman is a close official of the king, and everyone bows down to him except one guy, and that's Mordecai. And so Haman gets ticked off about that. He, you know, he's insulted that this Jewish guy will not bow down before him. It was part of his religion. He only bowed to one guy. And so Haman sent out this order and had the king agree to it. It was an edict to have not only Mordecai destroyed, but to have the whole Jewish nation, everybody that remained, completely annihilated. And so he sent this edict out to all of the provinces wherever King Xerxes reigned. And so now... Mordecai knows that there is a day that's coming where all of the Jewish people are going to be wiped out. And so Mordecai goes to Esther and he says, you're in a place where you can make a difference. And we need you to go to the king and to see if the king will reverse the order to have all of the Jewish people annihilated. And so now Esther has a choice to make. Mordecai has sent word to her begging her to intercede on behalf of the Jews to the king. The only problem is, is that she's faced with almost certain death if she approaches the king unannounced. This brings us to the passage that I want to look at this morning. It says in verse 12 that when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai understood and trusted that God would deliver his people one way or the other. He knew the history of the Jews and the faithfulness of God. And if Esther did not act, Mordecai was certain that help would come elsewhere. He knew that God was constantly working and setting things in motion for the good of his people. And he points this out to Esther that her newfound royalty may in fact be the reason that she was created not just placed there, created. It may have been the reason for the events that have unfolded throughout her entire life to bring her to this very moment to be used by God for the deliverance of His people. Esther was created for such a time as this. If you look at her response in her answer to Mordecai, we can see three disciplines that Esther, that set Esther apart as, as a servant of the Lord. These disciplines that she used set Esther apart as a vessel that God could use to further his purposes on earth. Now, as we the body of Christ 
called Jesus and Jeans seek to move forward and answer the call that God has for this ministry. These are three disciplines that, in my opinion, I believe that, that we must have in our lives as well. As I really tried to seek what, what God is doing, you know, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about certain uh, disciplines. You know, we, we've been talking about how we dealt, deal with doubt. That we all face doubt. Last week we talked about the issue of self-control. Um, and I, I told y'all that's one of the areas in, in my life I struggle with. You know, because uh, I have an addictive personality. And like I said last week, Teddy, did you have to eat the whole gallon of ice cream? <laughs> it, it was there. You know? And, and, and so... As I look at what God's doing in, in my life, I also have to look at what God's doing in this ministry. And, and it, I think it comes down to a disciplined life. I, I think it's the disciplines that we develop that God will use to take this ministry, to continue to grow this ministry in ways that none of us ever even could imagine Certainly, my, my brain is not big enough to be able to see all of, all of what God has done, even the, in the past year and a half. You know, I've told you all before, Jan and I, we take no compensation for this ministry. I, nobody pays me anything. I've told you before, you only wish I wanted your money. What I want is your heart, because that's what Christ wants. You can't pay me to do this. It is a calling on my life that I tried every way, just like when I asked an evangelist one time, can you tell me about what the calling is like on your life? He said, if there's any way you can get out of it, get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just astounded that this guy would say something. I said, why would you tell me that? He said, I'm telling you. If there's any way you can get out of it, get out of it. Don't do it. And, and I can't tell you how many times I, you know, I tell Jan that. I didn't want to do this. But God has moved in my heart and in our lives to, to do what I said I would never do again. Be careful what you say. That never stuff gets you in trouble. And so I want to look at these three disciplines that I believe are, are very important in all of our lives. The, the first thing is that disciplined people make right decisions. Disciplined people make right decisions. The thing that really touched me is that Esther sought God. When Mordecai came and said, I'm begging you, you need to go to the king and you need to talk to the king because we're, we're all going to be wiped out. And don't think just because you're sitting in the king's palace that you're going to get out of this. You see, most of us have never really faced a life and death decision that we had to make. Many of us, however, have had to make tough decisions that affected not only us, but family and friends as well. We, we may have agonized over the decision. We may have lost sleep. We, we may have looked at every possible outcome and every possible angle before we made up our mind. And, and then more often than not, we second guess the decision that we do end up making. And Esther gives us a good look at, at the proper way to take a big step. To make a big decision. To, it starts and it ends with earnestly seeking God. Lord, where are you in all of this? What are you doing and what would you have me do? What would you have us do? To earnestly seek God as we move forward. If you learn, look at verse 16, Esther instructs Mordecai to begin to fast and to instruct the other Jews to do the same. 
So here are the Jewish people. They're, they're fasting. And she said, I want you to, to pray and I want you to fast. <clears throat> and we want to seek God for three days. And so before Esther acted, before she moved, she sought God. Now, what she was about to do could have resulted in the sacrificing of her very life. And she made certain that she was right with God and in tune with His ways before she stepped out in faith. She ends this verse by saying something very powerful. If I perish, I perish. That's powerful words for a woman to say in those times. In those days. And, and it was not a fatalistic view of life. The way some people see life today. For she felt her life had no meaning. And then if she just died. Oh well. No, no big deal. Instead it was, a, it was a declaration of her complete faith and trust in God. If this is what God wanted, she was ready to die for it. I can't always say that. I'm pretty self-centered at times. He said, I, you know, I'll take a bullet for some people. For Jan, for my family, I've got friends, people I'm close to, my grandson. I take a bullet for. I'm not going to take a bullet for everybody. And Esther was willing to put her total faith and trust in God to say, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. In the same mindset, it's, it's, it's this total same mindset that Christ had in the garden. Where he said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. He knew that death was following him. He was willing to proceed because he knew it was the will of his father. Esther had that same determination. And like Christ, before she took that step of faith, she sought God and she asked those around her to do the same. Having sought God and knowing that he is leading can give us tremendous confidence to go forward in this ministry. Not only in this ministry, but in our lives, in our individual lives. Because the cool thing about this is that we come from so many diverse backgrounds. And God has brought us all together as one body to worship Him. I hope you see the amazing part of that. Of how God does those things. It's amazing to me that someone cannot believe in God. When you see what He does. If you just pay attention a little bit. He'll blow you away. And so disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined people make right decisions. The second point is, is that disciplined thought provides right understanding. That when we discipline ourselves and discipline our minds and our spirits, disciplined thought provides right understanding. Here's the cool thing, is that Esther understood her role in God's plan. Esther understood her role in God's plan. You see, Esther lived a comfortable life. She's queen. She was the queen of an empire. She wasn't queen for a day. Nobody remembers that show, huh? <laughs> Did I tell y'all I was 64? <laughs> she was the queen of an empire. 
She lived in luxury, and anything she could dream of or desire would be hers. She had kept her nationality a secret. So there's a good chance that her life might have been spared, even with the edict against the Jews, even if it was carried out. Esther could have chosen to sit in silence and comfort while those around her died. She could have justified it in her mind as not really being any of her business. Well, that's really not my business after all. I'm queen. I don't have to say anything about being Jewish. I can just sit here and mind my own business. It's not a bad gig. Who would question her decision to do that? Nobody. But instead, she understood the unique role that she could play in history. And she saw that God had put her in a situation where she could help. And she had an advantage being a Jew and also being the queen that put her in a position to serve God that no one else in the kingdom had at that time. Esther understood that her own, account, her own comfort and her own lifestyle took a back seat to the needs of the people around her who were about to perish. And I want you to see the parallel here to our lives. We may not live like royalty as Esther did. But we do live, pretty much for most of us, we live in comfort and security. Our needs are met. And, and we have a place to live. We have food to eat. We have family and friends to care for and to care for us. We've built nice lives. We, we don't like controversy and we don't like confrontation. And, and we could easily go through our days and, and turn a blind eye to those who are perishing around us and just saying, well, it's really none of our business. We just, we live in North Georgia. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, one day we're going to take the camera and spin that thing around where you can see what, what we live in up here. It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been around. And, and it just has all of these characteristics. And it would be easy for us to sit back. A lot of us are retired and you know, we're, we're doing other things now. And some of us are still working and still doing things. But we're in a, in a comfort zone that feels comfortable. We can go out on our boats. We can go fishing. We can go hunting and hiking. And we can do all these things while the rest of the world around us is, is falling apart. Who are we to interfere in the lives of others? But if we understand our role in God's plan we know that He's made it our responsibility to share life with those who are dying. To share hope with those who have none. To give comfort to those in need. We are the ones who are to go into all the world, as the Bible says, and preach the gospel. And I said, Earlier, the fact that you guys show up each week and, and introduce new people to what we're doing here, whether it's they come with you physically or whether they're watching over the internet, however you share that, we're doing our part. You are sharing the gospel with those around you. Does that make sense? Like I said, share the gospel every day and use words if you have to. Is it by invitation? It's by word of mouth. We don't do a lot of advertising to let people know what we're doing. And you guys show up. 
Go figure. And see, humanly, we, we, can't, we can't figure that out. Only God can do those things. Romans 10, 14 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? The Bible says that we are all ministers of reconciliation. And it's through our relationship with Jesus Christ, He has broken the chains of bondage. He has set us free. He has set us free to become His witnesses to those around us, to the power of Christ in us. That is the message we share. And He calls us to live our lives on purpose. Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Church, who I've, I've had the pleasure of being with and, and meeting on several occasions when I was on church staff. We go out to do a lot of conferences at Saddleback Church. He says it this way. He says, God doesn't recruit you without a calling. God calls everybody to use the gifts and the passion that they have. But not everyone picks up the phone. That's very true. God calls all of us that we each have gifts. Well, Daddy, what, what, what can I do? I don't know. But I know that God has gifted it up, all of us and He's given us passions and desire to do things in His name and in His power that we could not do in any other situation. And He's called us to do that. So my suggestion is if God puts a calling in your life, answer the phone, will you? The third discipline I want to talk about is that disciplined action renders results. Esther acted in boldness. This was the action step that she took. It, it validated the other two steps. Because the first two steps really would have been worthless if, if she had not accompanied that with action. And, and we can seek God and we can say we understand our role in His plan, but until we act on it, we haven't done what God has called us to do. In verse 16, Esther concludes her message to Mordecai by saying, When this is done, I will go to the king, and even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And she followed through on that. She just didn't talk about it. She went and she addressed the king. She approached the king and, and, and here's the cool thing. That God had already gone before her and prepared the king's heart in such a way that when the king saw Esther, Esther used all of her gifts, her beauty, her brains, and her wisdom from God to impact the king. Her beauty, her brains, and her personality. Those were gifts that God had given her. And she went to the king, and the king looked at her and said, Whoa. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> And Esther, I made a good choice at the queen thing. I did good. And he takes his golden scepter and he reaches out and says, come. And she walked over and she touched the scepter. And the king listened. And he said, whatever 
you want. Whatever question you ask of me, I will give to you up to half of the kingdom. Ask. He agreed to grant her his request. Long story short, the bad guy that we talked about, Haman, they came and put all of this stuff, stirred the pot, got the king all riled up. Yeah, sign this king. We're going to kill him. We're going to wipe him out. Guess what happened to him? He had built a set of gallows where he was going to hang Mordecai. Haman got hanged himself. God used the wisdom of Mordecai to touch his cousin who was the queen. And the Jews ended up being in a better position and in better circumstances as a result of God's deliverance than they would have been if none of this had ever happened. Deliverance came from God. But he used Esther, a willing vessel whom he had placed right where he wanted for such a time as this. I think that the reason this passage was impressed upon my heart this past week is obvious. I believe with all my heart that, that God has been molding this worship service for such a time as this. All that each of you have gone through in life, both good and bad, has brought us here to this point. We have an opportunity to impact the community around us for God's kingdom and to rescue people from the death sentence that they walk around under. That's been handed down to them in new and exciting ways if we step out of faith or step out in faith. Each week as, as we gather together in this place with this ministry called Jesus in Jeans, we have the opportunity to become real change agents. You know, that's a hot word right now. So-and-so is a change agent. God wants to use us as real change agents for His glory. For His good. We have the opportunity to become change agents in a world that needs to hear the good news of the gospel. And I hope they can see it in each one of us. And my prayer is, is that we never take it for granted. We never take for granted what God has created through all of us. Not through me. I take no credit. I tell you all the time, I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. I don't take myself seriously. I know that what is happening here is because God has his hand on what we're doing. And I'm thankful for that. I want to close today. Just um, My voice is just a little weak. I've been working pretty hard this weekend. Well. <laughs> it's a song I wrote. I'll take a little sip here before I go. And I want you to listen to the words. And I want you to think about what God is doing in your life. How can God use you? What are the gifts? What are the passions? What are the desires? What are the things that he has given you in his life? In this life? That you could give to him and say, Lord, use me. You think about that as I say it. 
There's a family down the street with nowhere to turn, no one to help them make it through another day. They're losing all their hope, holding on the dream, searching for a way. Could we help them? We could help them. We've been called to live for such. Take the love of Jesus to the world around us. We've been called to give all we have to give to make a sacrifice that we might leave for such a time as this. I know they'll come again. We'll stand before hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Looking back to now, we made it through somehow. But in our hearts we knew it was worth it. It was worth it all. We've been called to live for such a time as this. To take the love of Jesus to the world. say thank you thank you for reviving this old heart thank you for reviving the desire to teach your word and father I, I pray that you would help all of us develop the disciplines that we need to to make right decisions to to really think through what you're doing in our lives and then father on on top of that, to make those valid, Father, help us to take action. And to be active in our communities and be active in our families and be active in every area, Father, that you would use us for your glory. Because, Father, we are seeing lives change. We are seeing things happen in people's lives, Father, that has nothing to do with who I am or what I say or what I do, God. I am very clear that this is, uh, this is just a conduit for a bigger thing that you want to do. 
in your word, you always remind us that you are constantly doing something new. And so, Father, help us to be aware of that. Give us those eyes to see. To be able to look around and see where you're working and what you're doing. Give us ears to listen to the people around us, Father. And then give us the, that initiative to take action and be a part of their lives. We don't have to be odd for God to do that. All we've got to do is be there at the right time in the right place for such a time as this. We love you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless you.